Hi there, my name is Will Eastham. I have the privilege of serving as a pastoral resident here at Bridgeway. And I just wanted to take a quick moment to welcome you to our YouTube channel and to this uh, playlist for our essential series, a, a series of sermons that we're gonna be collecting together, curating together to hopefully help equip you as a follower and disciple of Jesus Christ. Each of these sermons has been preached by our founding and senior pastor, Dr. David Anderson. And we invite you as you receive this word uh, to engage with us, whether it's on our social media platforms or just through commenting directly on this video. We wanna hear from you. We hope that these words bless you. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy the sermon. That guy, Antonio, needs some help, no doubt about it, if you saw that video. Well, today, let's get into the message on how to encourage yourself, how to be your own CEO, your chief encouragement officer, so you don't have to end up with a cheesy guru like that. Let's open in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we go into this message, we do pray that your spirit of encouragement would be upon everyone who's watching this in their car, in their living room, wherever they are on their smartphone. Would you speak encouragement into their life? Be with those who are in Ukraine and Russia and in Europe right now that you even in the toughest of situations, and we ask that the Prince of Peace would descend indeed. It's in your name we pray. Together, everyone said, amen and amen. Well, in a day of such discouragement, hard news, loss, and a lack of available mental health care, the art of biblical self-encouragement is something we must all pay attention to. My prayer today in this message and in the next four weeks in this series that I'm doing called Be Encouraged, I want to pour much hope into your encouragement tank so you can be equipped to grow mature and mighty in Christ. In fact, tonight I'm going to do a one-on-one -on -one connection with you. Anybody that wants to come, uh, go to bridgeway.cc slash events, where we will actually have a conversation about today's sermon at 7 p.m. Bridgeway.cc slash events for a great sermon conversation. You might want to dialogue with me and other leaders about today's topic. But right now, if you have a copy of the scriptures or a smartphone, I want you to turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter 30. I'm going to read the first eight verses, and we're going to talk about a guy named David who was leading uh, mighty men in a war, and when they got back to their home where they were living, they found something very discouraging out. Let's pick it up at verse 1. David and his men reached Ziglag on the third day. That was the place that they were living with their families. Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Ziglag. They had attacked Ziglag and burned it and had taken captive the women and everyone else in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. So they took the women and children, kidnapped them. Verse 3. When David and his men returned home or reached Ziglag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters were taken captive. So David and his men wept out loud until they had no strength left to weep. Have you ever cried so much that you have no more strength to cry? David's two wives had been captured. Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. Key verse, verse 6, David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in his spirit because of his sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord his God. Or the way the King James puts it, David encouraged himself in the Lord. Then David said to Abathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. Abathar brought it to him, and David inquired of the Lord, should I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, he answered. 
you will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. David had a crisis on his hands. His wife and his children were taken captive and along with all the other soldiers, their wives and their children have been taken as hostages, kidnapped. As a result of his leadership decision, the other families were affected. The men talked about actually stoning their own leader, David. What do you do when public sentiment turns against you? What do you do when people who are following you now want to fire you or fight you? What do you do when one of your fans becomes one of your enemies? How do you handle those who were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, one day, and now they're saying, crucify him, crucify him the next day? The very men that were following David now wanted to kill him. And this led to David being distressed. And in verse 6, it says, greatly distressed. Have you ever been greatly distressed in your spirit? And in this particular story, it demonstrates that an outer crisis can lead to emotional distress, depression, and despair. Outer crises can lead to pain and brokenness. And I think we can all understand this naturally speaking, can't we? You get fired from a job. Your boyfriend or your girlfriend break up with you. Your friends in school gang up on you on social media. Your medical diagnosis comes back unfavorable. Or your house catches on fire. Like what happened last week to one of our beloved attenders, R.G. Romero. And we're praying for you, my sister, and your family. But you see, these kinds of events lead to discouragement and can send us into the dark corners of negativity. What happens when there are outer crises, we can understand that it can lead to distress. But what about the things that happen inside? Is there something that can happen inside that's so painful and confusing, leading to despair? What happens when there's nothing you can tie to your feelings? There's no outer crisis at all. You know you feel something on the inside, but there's no outer crisis, and you can't seem to understand it. You just know that you feel lost inside. You can't put your finger on it. You can't attach the feeling to a crisis. The outer crisis we understand. But what about when you feel stuff inside that you can't label and connect to a particular crisis? You only know that inside you feel something and you can't put your finger on it. Let me tell you a story. A few days, a couple of weeks ago, I was getting gas at a station and usually I'll stop en route from you know, my house to the office or something like that. I'll be on the highways and byways and I'll get just enough gas to make sure that everything's filled up. And most recently, my truck was making an odd sputtering sound. <laughs> now, I knew I had enough fuel in it, so I was a bit befuddled by the sputtering sound. I took the car to the dealer so that they, they could diagnose the problem. A day or two later, the mechanic called to inform me that my oil tank was empty and barely had oil in it. I was so confused. I've had this vehicle just for a few months, and, and why would the oil be low? And on top of that, why would there not be something on the dashboard of this nice car that would say you need to change the oil? He went on to tell me that... Some cars take about four to five quarts, but your truck, Dr. Anderson, takes about eight quarts of synthetic oil. And I said, yeah, but there's a light that's supposed to come on. He says, yes, that's the 20% oil life light. But he explained to me that that doesn't mean you have 20% oil left. I said, well, what does it mean? He says, it tells you that you have 20% oil life in the oil that's left. Not, you have 20% oil left, go get more oil. 
I say, well, I don't understand this. It's a bit confusing, but thank you very much. I get it. And I don't know if you understand that. All I know is that there's a difference between the quantity of oil and the quality of oil. And they're saying that that 20% oil life light is telling you about the quality of oil that is in your tank. Here's the point. Even though my truck is beautiful on the outside, I keep it clean. It's shiny. It looks good. There was something on the inside under the hood that was draining out and I didn't even know it. Had I not gone to get help in diagnosing the problem when I did, my truck could have ended in disaster. In a sense, I thank God for the sputtering which alerted me that my truck needed help. And for some of you, Life seems to be going fine. Family's fine. Finances are fine. Home is fine. Faith is fine. But there's something sputtering in your spirit. If everything seems okay, then why do I feel blue, bland? Blah. Why do I feel a little depressed? Why do I feel a little sad? I have no reason to feel down. I have no reason to feel depressed. I have no reason to be discouraged. It just doesn't make sense. Yet something under the hood of your life is causing you to realize that there is a a sputtering sound of grace alerting you to pay attention to what's happening inside of you. Just because you have a pretty car doesn't mean you have good oil. And just because you have a full gas tank doesn't mean you have good oil. And just because you have good tires and shiny wheels and a nice interior doesn't mean you have Good oil. Just because you had a great television show where you traveled the world and ate great foods didn't mean that Anthony Bourdain had good oil. Something was draining on the inside. Just because she had great purses and products did not mean that Kate Spade had good oil. Something was draining on the inside. And just because Ian Alexander Jr., the son of actress Regina King, had a beautiful relationship with his famous mother doesn't mean he had good oil. Oil, something was draining on the inside. And just because she was beautiful and won the Miss USA pageant in 2019 doesn't mean that Chesley Chris's oil wasn't draining on the inside. Friends, mental illness is real. And each of these people I mentioned were famous people who died by suicide. But there are so many others who are not famous or popular, but they are stuck in the dark shadows of despair. They're senior citizens, they're teenagers, they're LGBT plus people, they're military veterans, they're pastors, churchgoers, Everyday people like you and me, you can be black or white or Asian or Hispanic or Arab or African or male or female. Depression doesn't discriminate. And discouragement doesn't park only in poor zip codes and in rundown neighborhoods. 
Despair doesn't bypass the educated and the elite and despondency doesn't take into account your net worth. Mental illness is real. So right now, what I want to do, wherever you are, whatever living room you're in, whatever apartment you're in, wherever you're seated, if you have a cell phone, I want you to pull your cell phone out right now and put this number in it. I want every single person to put the National Suicide Lifeline number in their contacts. I have it in mind. Go ahead. Take the time. Pull your phone out. Open up your contacts and put this number in. 800-273. Write it down if you have to. 8255, or the word talk. 800-273-TALK. Everyone should have this in their cell phone. Whether it's for you or whether it's for somebody else. I got a call just this week, and they said to me, listen, I know somebody that might be on the edge. I said, hang on. And I opened up my contacts. I said, give them this number. Whether you're feeling it, whether a family member's feeling it, whether a church member's feeling it, someone in your life group's feeling it, someone in your neighborhood's feeling it. If somebody's feeling kind of low and they need to talk to someone, that number's available This is not the time to try to figure it out. Keep it in your contacts. What I also want you to do is I want you to go to my Instagram, at Anderson Speaks, and you'll see a post there that has this number as well. And when you see that number on the post, like it, forward it to other people so that they will have it. Follow me as well, but forward this thing. Screenshot it if you want to. I want everybody to have this number. Now, we have other resources here. We have our Bridgeway Mental Health and Faith Ministry. We have Tuesday Night Care. If you uh, go to bridgeway.cc support, you're going to see so much there. Not only our mental faith and health ministry, you're going to see Tuesday night groups that you can join on Zoom. Everything from addictions to divorce recovery to feeling mentally low, whatever it is, you're going to be amazed. After the service, go check it out. Don't scroll through all of it now, but at least uh, take a screenshot of the, of the address. It's bridgeway.cc slash support. You see, all the other outer trappings of life cannot place the need for regular attention and maintenance that we all need to keep our lives running well. In fact, I believe that the oil in your encouragement tank needs to be changed regularly in order for you to keep moving on the road of life. And regardless of how the outside looks, if the oil of encouragement is not flowing, you're not going If the oil of encouragement is not flowing, you're not going. Encouragement is the oil that your spirit needs to keep you moving down the road of life. Why don't you tell somebody, even in the chat, just say, check your oil. Check your oil. Just type it in there. Check your oil. Maybe you can type this. Change your oil. Change your oil. Don't ignore the sputtering in your spirit. And whether it's an inner sputtering where no one can notice your pain, or whether it's an outer crisis like David was facing in 1 Samuel 30 when everyone discovered that their families had been kidnapped, you must choose to address your need for strength, for oil, for help. So what did David do? Can we attack our discouragement in the same way he did? I think yes. Do what David did in his discouragement. You know what David did? He turned to the Lord for strength and for wisdom. I was telling a friend just the other day that I think, I think the sputtering's gone. I remember I had heard the sputtering and then I said, let me go to the dealer. But then on my way to the dealer, I had to stop and get some more gas. And I, as I let the window down and I said, oh, I think the sputtering's gone. I don't need to take it to the dealer after all. That's awesome. That's great. The sputtering is gone. But when I stopped, I turned off the music. 
and I got out of the car, guess what? I could hear the sputtering again. You see, sometimes we have to turn down the noise and listen. David turned to the Lord. He inquired of the Lord. He listened to the Lord in 1 Samuel chapter 30. Listen to verses 7 and 8. It says this. Then David said to Abathar, the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. Abathar brought it to him. Verse 8, and David inquired of the Lord. Shall I pursue this, ra this raiding party? Will I overtake them? He says, bring me the ephod. Now, I'm like, what's an ephod? <laughs> what's up with this whole ephod thing? Do y'all know what an ephod is? An ephod is a garment for priests that they would wear before the Lord. Whenever they would come into the presence of the Lord. It was an ornate garment made of, of linen and other jewels to cover the breastplate area of the priest. Only priests and Levites could wear this garment. However, warriors, on the other hand, they also wore an ephod. It wasn't made of linen. It was a different kind. It was a hard breastplate for war. So there were two different kinds of ephods. One for the priests, the Levites, the ones that would come into the presence of the Lord, and one for the soldier when they were going out to fight. What's interesting is that David wasn't a priest, yet he was familiar with the ephod. We know that David was a warring soldier. They were out at war when they came back to find that their families were missing. And yet David is calling the priest for a clerical ephod, not a military one. Why wouldn't he say to the military guys, bring me, my, bring me my armor, bring me my ephod? He was a military man, but he didn't. In this moment of discouragement, he calls on the priest to bring a garment that would take him before the Lord. We also see in other texts, like in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 14, Listen to what it says. David, wearing a linen ephod, danced before the Lord with all his might, while he and the entire house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord, which was the presence of God, with shouts and the sounds of trumpets. Check it out. When David was in distress, he called for the priests to bring the ephod. What was David doing? You see, while David wore an ephod for worship when dancing, he also wore one when he was at war fighting. And I believe that David knew that if he was going to be victorious, that he would need to get before the Lord. I believe that David put on the ephod to bring together his worshiping spirit and his warrior spirit. You see, David realized that he was in spiritual warfare when he was feeling the discouragement in his heart. When people were saying to him that they might stone and kill them, David realized that his warrior spirit wasn't enough. He couldn't fight back all the things that were coming toward him. He couldn't fight the negative words. He couldn't fight the negative encounters with others. He couldn't fight what had been taken from him, what he had lost with his wives, what he had lost with his children, what he had lost with his material possessions. Now what he had lost with the teammates that were with him fighting. He could not have enough warrior in him to fight against all of that and to push back his discouragement. And David realized that a military ephod and armor wasn't enough for this battle. David was going to have to have victory beyond military victory. He first needed to have a victory spiritually, emotionally, mentally. David was about to use, listen, his worship as a weapon 
against the enemy. David was using his worship as a war cry against his depression. David was getting strength from being in the presence of the Lord. Sometimes you have to fight for your sanity through worship. Sometimes you have to fight for your victory through praise. And sometimes you have to dance your way out of your problem. Sometimes you have to dance your way to victory. And David turned down the noise, the chatter about stoning him. He tuned his ear to the Lord, and then he turned up his worship. This was David's way of changing his oil. Say, change your oil. Change your oil. Change your oil. Isaiah 61, 3 says this, listen, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Wow. God wants to exchange your ashes with beauty. God wants to exchange your mourning with oil of joy. God wants to change your spirit of heaviness with the garment of praise. Beloved, worship your way to your breakthrough. You know something about lions? When lions roar, they don't roar when they're on the prowl. They don't roar when they are just walking about. Lions roar after they've had the victory. Somebody needs to roar their way to victory. Somebody needs to roar their way to victory by faith, knowing that they will succeed. I wish somebody would just dance their way to victory right in your living room right now, right in your kitchen right now, right in your bedroom right now. I wish somebody would clap their hands toward their victory by faith, knowing that praise will confuse the enemy and will blind him like the colors I wear. He is the most confused person when you start worshiping in the name of Jesus. Demons bow when Jesus' name is lifted up. And maybe right Right there where you are, you lift your hands up in praise, but don't turn it up like this. When I lift my hands like this, it's, Lord, I adore you. Lord, I surrender to you. Lord, I receive from you. But when you lift up a praise, turn your hands around like this and lift up the name of Jesus. And when you lift up the name of Jesus and you begin to move, all of a sudden in the midst of your situation, God will begin to encourage your heart and the enemy will be confused, so confused that he will have to leave because he cannot stand in the praises of God's people. You're wondering why I can't get out of it. Lift up a praise. Get up out of yourself. Get up out of your situation. Get up out of your despair. It doesn't matter what's going on. When you begin to put on that ephod of praise, God will exchange that spirit of heaviness with a garment of praise. Worship is your weapon. Worship not only ascribes glory to God and his worth, but how many of you know worship can be a weapon against the enemy? The next time you feel downcast, lift up a praise. See what happens. Your ephod is your garment of praise. When the pills aren't enough, praise them. When the medicine's not enough, praise them. When the food can't soothe you enough, praise them. When the addiction can't cover your pain enough, praise them. When the alcohol can't anesthetize you enough, 
Praise him. Put on your ephod. Put on your garment of praise. Lift up your hands to God. And when you don't know what else to say, you don't have to be a worship leader. Just say hallelujah. Just say hallelujah. You can type in hallelujah right now. You can type in praise him right now. Praise him anyhow. You can say hallelujah. You can say victory is mine. You can say glory to God. Say what you need to say. 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 And if you can't think of anything else to say, then call on the name of Jesus. Just say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Demons sputter and shudder at the name of Jesus. The name of the Lord is a strong tower, and those that run to it are safe. If only I had three people right now that would give God the praise. God can change the atmosphere in your house. He can change the atmosphere in your car. He can change the atmosphere in your small group. He can change the atmosphere wherever you are, whatever country, whatever city. He can even change the atmosphere right now in the midst of war in Ukraine. Just lift up a praise to Almighty God. Find your strength in the Lord. Let go and let God worship your way out of that despair. Worship your way out of that dark corner. You see, your worry won't take you out of your depression. You can't worry and worship at the same time. You got to choose one or the other. The more you worry, the deeper you go into the dark hole. The more you worship, the more you come out of the dark hole. But you can't worry and worship at the same time. Some of you are trying to worry your way out of your legal situation because that court date's coming. Why don't you worship yourself toward where you need to go? Because you can either choose to worry or you can choose to worship, but you can't do both. You will never worry your way to encouragement. I promise you that. Worry is not good oil. Worship is good oil. Say, change your oil. Some of you need to change your oil. Worship can be your your tune-up. Worship can change the sputtering in your spirit with the new sound of victory. And right now, I declare and I decree that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. I declare and I decree that you will live and you will not die. I speak life into you in the name of Jesus. I speak hope into you in the name of Jesus, that you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength, that you are the head and not the tail, that you are the chosen and the predestined child of God who has victory in Christ alone. So let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Say what you need to say. 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 Let everything that has breath praise the Lord and tell the enemy in a me that I choose to walk by faith and not by sight. Tell the enemy in a me that I will look unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, the maker of the heavens and the earth. Declare that God is my refuge and my strength, a very present help in trouble. And when it's all said and done, as the chief encouragement officer of your life, choose to say what God said. When in Psalm 46, 10, he said this, be still and know that I am God. Well, I hope that that sermon ministered to you and not only encouraged your heart, but also expanded your mind and your understanding of God's word. If this sermon blessed you, I invite you to just share it on your social media account, to like it, or even to subscribe to our channel so you can keep receiving uh, transformative words from God's word, along with all the other creative elements that we do here at Bridgeway uh, to hopefully minister to you and to your spirit. I hope you have a great day. We look forward to seeing you again soon.